It might be helpful if you've got uh, one of these open in front of your Bible as we look at Lamentations uh, chapter 5, the final uh, poem, the final piece in Lamentations that we've been looking at over the last five weeks. Uh, this week I read a news article which said, if you want to achieve maximum health, here are a few tips. So if you want to be healthy, here are a few tips for you. Exercise regularly, eat nutritious and minimally processed foods, drop extra pounds and pray. That's what it said. Um, you laugh. Um, regular prayer and meditation, it says, is shown to be healthy for people. It's good for people. People's not just emotional well-being, but apparently their physical well-being. A survey in America, it's always America, isn't it? No offense. Uh, the University of Rochester in the United States found that uh, people who are poorly, 85% of them pray. It says that makes prayer the most used non-traditional healing method. It's prayer. Now, whatever we think of those types of things, I guess many of us have an instinct when times are hard, perhaps we're suffering, maybe suffering physically or things that are happening to us, the instinct often is to pray. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes we are just calling out before God, crying perhaps before God. But the instinct for us is to pray. And that's what we have in Lamentations 5. As we come to the, the, sort of the climax of the book, it's a prayer. A prayer to God. As we sort of come to the summary of thinking about um, the misery of what it means to live in a broken world, as we think about the effects of sin in this world, as we've seen for quite a few weeks now, as we think about God's anger at sin, we've seen that quite a few times, chapter 2 and chapter 4, God pouring his anger out. As we think even of God's mercies, his, uh, his compassions never failing, Jeremiah comes to the conclusion of prayer. Prayer is the sort of summary of this book. And that's because prayer is the sort of outward expression, the outward expression of faith and trust in God. That if we believe that his mercies never fail, if we believe that he is in control, that he loves us, that he cares for us, even in the midst of all the stuff that's happening in our lives, uh, Jeremiah says, well, the instinct therefore is to pray. It's the sort of outward expression of our faith in God. So we're going to look at this prayer uh, that Jeremiah gives in chapter 5. But of course, when we're in hard times, sometimes if our instinct is to pray, we don't always know what to pray. It's hard sometimes to know how we ought to pray, particularly when we're suffering, particularly when we're struggling. And we're going to see three elements uh, of what prayer looks like for us. The first is we tell God our problems. We tell God our problems. Now, chapter 5, the great bulk of chapter 5, is another poem, another lament, uh, retelling the misery, the struggle, the brokenness of God's people in Jeremiah's day, about 500 years before Jesus. Uh, but it's a retelling of the story as a prayer. Look at verse 1. It's a calling out to God. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. It's addressing God. We've seen quite a few times, well done for sticking with us, um, we've seen quite a few times Jeremiah lamenting, pouring his heart out, but he was lamenting, not addressing God in those chapters, he was sort of speaking to the people or, or sort of speaking to the, the reader as it were, but here he's directly addressing God, he's taking his lament in a prayer to God, he's recounting the misery but taking it to God in prayer, this is slightly different to what we've seen so far, it's a prayer of lament. Now, we, um, as, uh, as sort of Christians, may feel at this stage, well, that's all well and good, Jeremiah, but of course, what you need to get onto is to actually ask God for things. You need to get onto the supplication. You need to remember the gospel, all this sort of wallowing in sin, all this sort of lamenting all the bad stuff. Surely you need to apply the gospel to yourself. And of course, he will, and we will do that this evening. But it's worth remembering, as we, even if you just casually glance down at chapter 5, the great bulk of the chapter is lamenting. He's talking again about misery and the brokenness of the world. He doesn't rush to the gospel. He does get there in the end, as we'll see, but he doesn't even rush to asking God for things. He, he spends time lamenting, mourning, grieving over what has happened both in his life and in the country, the world around him. I think that's a helpful reminder to us that perhaps sometimes we need to spend more time lamenting grieving, perhaps pouring our hearts out to God, not pretending things are okay, 
Not going straight to the supplication, the asking God stuff, although that is important, as we'll see, but grieving, lamenting, pouring our hearts out, not putting on a stiff upper lip, but being real with God in prayer. Just look at how Jeremiah does it. Verse 2. He says, Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We've become orphans. We're like widows, he says. Now, the inheritance here that Jeremiah is talking about is the promised land. If you remember all the way back in Genesis, in Genesis 12, God made a promise, the covenant to Abraham, that that land would be for Abraham's descendants and they would live in that land. And so the language here, that was their inheritance, being turned over to aliens and foreigners. That was because the Babylonians had come and they'd ransacked the place and they'd taken God's people off and they were no longer living in the promised land. I suspect not many of us can imagine that scenario, although perhaps there are some people in church who can imagine that scenario, being taken away from their land, taken away from their homes. But this was a religious disaster. This was a theological disaster. The fact that they weren't in the land called into question God's faithfulness. He'd promised this land in the covenant with Abraham. Now they weren't in the land. Was God unfaithful to his covenant promises? Or verse uh, 16, which talks about the crown has fallen from our head. Now that could be referring to sort of the bad times of, of sort of come in, the good times have ended. But if you remember back in chapter 4, chapter 4 verse 20, Jeremiah talked about the anointed of the Lord, the king dying. The crown had fallen. And that wasn't just a social problem for the country, a political problem. It was a religious problem because God had promised David something. He had promised David that one of David's descendants would rule forever. The kings were part of God's promise, the covenant with David. The fact there wasn't a king on the throne now, the fact they were going into exile called into God's into question God's faithfulness even to that promise. Was God faithful? This is a theological problem that Jeremiah is mourning over. And the effects of that are found in society. Uh, just look, verse 3. Uh, people becoming orphans. Mothers are like widows. Young men, families torn apart. Or verse 11. Imagine what it would be to live in a society where verse 11 was true, in the cities, in the towns. Or verse 12, the princes, the rulers, the respected people are not respected. They're hung up, they're killed. Verse 13, boys staggering under loads of wood, unable to provide. We see that in verse 4. Paying for the water that they drink, the wood coming at a price. Verses 6 and 9 talk about the lack of bread in society. These things they were suffering from, that Jeremiah several times has mentioned these things. These things are because they had broken the covenant. They had broken their promises. They had broken God's moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments. All of these covenants, it seems, have been broken. And because God said, if you reject me, if you reject my ways then you will be kicked out from the land. And Jeremiah is mourning over those things. He's lamenting them. He's taking them to God. That's why he's saying them. He's not wallowing. Remember, he's praying. He says, remember, O Lord, that these things have happened. He's taking the miseries that he's experiencing in his world, in his life, and he's taking them to God in prayer. And it is a reminder to us this evening not to bottle things up, but to call out to God, to cry out to him, to seek him, to mourn living in this world. We're to lament. Now, there was uh, an article on CNN a few years ago that really caught my attention. Um, it talks about this type of theme. It was about uh, the two different reactions in the United States. Police had shot and killed two black men, one in Charlotte in North Carolina and another in Tulsa in Oklahoma. And the article from CNN was entitled Why Charlotte Exploded and Tulsa prayed. And it goes on to talk about two different reactions in two different cities to basically the same event happening in those places. And it said in Charlotte, in North Carolina, there was looting. There was rioting. People expressed their anger on the streets. You can see the pictures of it. That's what happened in Charlotte, in North Carolina. But in Tulsa, the same event happened 
but instead they prayed. And the reason they prayed was because a local church pastor invited people into the church building to lament. Not just the church family, but the community, the neighborhood, to come in and to grieve publicly, to lament, to pour out their hearts, to cry out in anger. Sometimes it says expressing a sort of righteous anger at bad things that had happened, but to grieve together, to lament. It's not sub-Christian to do that, to call out to God. Many of the Psalms are full of it. To call out to God is what we're to do in a broken world. It's messy, it's gritty, it's raw, it's painful, it's emotional, but it's real and it's biblical. We're to do it. And we're to do it because God is our Father. He cares for us. Jesus is our brother. He cares for us. We are to seek God together. And when we pray, we tell God what's happening. We tell him the hurt. We tell him what we're experiencing. We learn to lament. I suspect, if you're anything like me, this is a bit of a challenge for our prayer lives, to lament the things that are happening in our world. So that's the first, uh, the first element. We tell God our problems. We're real with him. The second is we remember who God is. We remember who God is. That's verse 1. It says, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Now, when the writers of the Bible say things like, God, remember, or God, look upon or behold, uh, they're not implying that he wasn't already doing those things. Jeremiah knows that God is already looking. He's already seeing all things, that God remembers all. There's no possible way that God could forget something. Perhaps you were forgetful. Or perhaps there are people in your life, perhaps a, a family member or a spouse who has to remind you several times to be doing things. Becca is probably watching the live stream now and nodding her head. We're like that, aren't we? Often we're forgetful. God is not forgetful. He knows all things. There is no possible piece of information that God does not know. He does not forget things. But when the Bible talks about God remembering or God looking upon, God beholding, that's language of God being faithful to his covenant, remembering his promises, being true to his promises. So you think back in Genesis, when Noah was in the ark, it says God remembered Noah. He hadn't forgotten him, but he remembered Noah and was about to act for Noah's sake. Or when he sends the rainbow, it says well, God will remember his covenant. It's not that God forgets it and then sees the rainbow and suddenly sort of remembers, but it's a sign of him being faithful. Or at the time of the golden calf, Moses says, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember them. Asking God to remember is saying, please, God, be gracious to us. Be faithful to what you have promised to be true. They had broken the covenants, but God hadn't. They were faithless, but God was always faithful to his promises. And as they pray, God, remember us. Look upon us. They are saying, be faithful, be true to the promises that you have made. Keep your promises. Show us your faithfulness. It's extraordinary. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of this brokenness, this lament, Jeremiah can still see through the fog and still remember God's faithfulness, still call out to God. He remembers God's character, that he will be faithful to his promises, and he prays that. Now, of course, this raises the question for us, well, what promises has God made us then? What covenant promises can we claim for ourselves? Now, Jeremiah was living before Jesus. His covenant promises were a king to rule forever, a Messiah one day to come. Of course, those are our covenant promises, living in the new covenant of the Messiah who has already come, who has bled on the cross for our sins, who has taken away all of our reproach, who has given us his spirit, he's poured out his love to us through the spirit, that Christ has come, that he has been exiled, taken away from God's love for us to come in. All of those promises of the good news of the gospel Perhaps the things that we sing about on a regular basis, the things that we're very familiar with, well, those are the covenant promises that God has made to us. Those are the promises that we can pray that God will be faithful to. Lord, remember those promises. 
be gracious to us on the basis of those promises. When we suffer, when we go through uh, perhaps miserable times, when we sin, we're to remember who God is, a God who has sent his own son for us, who has crucified his own son so that we could go free. And of course, as we ask God to be faithful to those promises, as we ask God to remember those promises, we're remembering those promises. We're applying the gospel to ourselves. We're remembering Christ has been crucified for us. So Jeremiah prays, in the midst of suffering, he remembers who God is, what promises God has made. But he also, in verse 19, remembers an important truth about who God is. As he comes to the climax of the book, book about suffering, he says, You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. He remembers that even in the bleakest of times, even in the hardest of times, in his uh, sin, in the misery, God is sovereign. God is still in control. He is still on his throne. We've seen this a few times in Lamentations. God is still in control of this situation. He may not be able to see how that is the case. He may not understand it at the time. He may not ever fully understand how God was working in a situation. But he knows it's true. He says, your throne from generation to generation. When you think about it, the Assyrians came in and took off Israel. The Babylonians came in and took off Judah. The Greeks came in. The Romans came in. Empires come and go. The British Empire comes and goes. But God never does. God always remains steadfast. He is always there, always unmoving, always faithful. In a world that seems to be spinning out of control, God is unmovable, unflappable. He is sovereign and reliable. And Jeremiah remembers that. So we ask God to remember verse 1, but we, of course, remember those things about God. The promises that he has made and the fact that he is totally sovereign. So we tell God our problems, we remember who God is, and then thirdly, uh, we confess our sins. Now in Jeremiah, we've seen that on the one hand, lots of misery, lots of suffering has come, not because of particular individuals sinning. The stuff that he was enduring wasn't necessarily because of his sin. There's no direct link always between our suffering and our sin, although sometimes there perhaps might be. But nevertheless, living in a broken world, living in a messed up society where people hurt, where people sin, Jeremiah wants to confess sin, particularly for God's people, that they had broken the covenant and therefore were facing the condemnation from God. Look at verse 16. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. He acknowledges the fact that he has sinned, that he has sinned against God. He he confesses that before him. We've seen it a few times in Lamentations. If you keep a finger in Lamentations 5 and turn back to chapter 3, and you'll see in chapter 3, verse 42, uh, 41, where he says, Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. An acknowledgement that the people have transgressed. They have rebelled against God. That's what he's saying in verse 16 of our chapter, or verse 21 of our chapter. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days of old. That language of of renewing, of turning back, of restoration, is language of repentance. Turning away from sin and turning another way to God. It's a language of turning and confessing of sin, turning to God in repentance. It's not wallowing in sin. It's not sort of enjoying being in in the guilt, but it's taking it to God, confessing it before God. And that is vital that we do that for two reasons. It's vital to be saved for salvation. There can be no salvation apart from repentance and faith, turning away from sin and repenting and confessing it to God, coming to God, we simply won't get to heaven unless we have repented of our sins. 
It's essential for salvation. It's also essential for an ongoing relationship. Just think, perhaps there's somebody you've fallen out with, maybe today, even in a small way. Uh, Perhaps somebody you've fallen out with or a friendship that's been sort of perhaps broken or ruined or perhaps a neighbor that you've had a dispute with over something. When we fall out with people, when relationships are fractured, even in a small way, they only really get repaired when somebody says sorry. When somebody takes that step to say sorry, to admit guilt, to admit wrongdoing. That's true even on the very smallest of relationships, the smallest of offenses. When it comes to our relationship with God, a holy God, we must confess our sins. We must confess them to be in relationship with him. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, I have confessed my sins. I confessed them in the summer of 1974 when I became a Christian. That's great if you did that. But confession of sins must be an ongoing thing. We're to continually to seek and to repent and to confess our sins. Just think of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says, this is how you're to pray. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins. He didn't say just pray that as you become a Christian. It's ongoingly. Or 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. We're to be doing that in an ongoing sense in our relationship with God. It's not wallowing in sin. It's not forgetting the gospel. It's not becoming a Christian every time we do it. We know that we've been saved if we've confessed our sins. But we're to keep doing that to keep seeking him, to keep repenting, to keep turning to him and acknowledging our wrongdoing, to flourish in our love for God, in our relationship with God, we must be confessing sins, taking them to him. It's an important part of Christian discipleship. But notice here, it's important that we do it corporately. Because look at verse 16. He doesn't say, woe to me, for I have sinned. He says, woe to us, for we have sinned. Now, there have been parts of Lamentations where Jeremiah was talking in the first person. He's been talking about I, me. Here, he's talking us. And he's saying, uh, we have sinned. It's a communal confession of sin. It's important that confession happens personally, perhaps the things that we, the secret sins that perhaps we need to confess to God on a personal level. But we ought to be able to do that with other people. So confess our sins in a corporate sense. I went to a conference a few years ago in London, which was about worship, Um, not just singing, but a sort of broader biblical theology of worship, what it meant to be God's people and to worship him, the very purpose for which God had called his people out out of Egypt, the very purpose which God saves us today is to give him the glory. And it was an excellent conference, and I really enjoyed it, and they gave away some free books, which is always a good sign in a conference. And one of the books was called uh, About Reformation Worship. And this is, this is a bit geeky, but you have to bear with me. One of the things in the book was great was various different orders of service from churches throughout church history. I can see you're all really excited about this. <laughs> and uh, one of the very interesting things was in the Reformation 500 years ago, uh, in the Reformation and then in the sort of few decades and century after the Reformation, almost every church particularly people that you've ever sort of heard of, even the people that uh, I've never heard of, who were sort of reformers or sort of just in the post-Reformation era, in almost every service, in every reformer, in, across the decades, across the countries, they have had something in their orders of service that we hardly ever have. Not just us, but our types of churches. I've been in quite a few FIEC and other types of churches Something that we never have. You can probably guess what it is, thinking about the third point. A corporate confession of sin. They had it every week without fail. It would have been unthinkable, probably. And perhaps once or twice, the service leader forgot it. But generally speaking, they always had it. They always confessed their sins together. And once they'd done that, they always had the declaration of forgiveness of sins, the absolution. Not that the pastor or the service leader absolved their sins. That was the whole point of the Reformation. But they declared that Jesus had forgiven people's sins if they'd confessed. They remembered the gospel together. Now, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in our church. I've led lots of services here so far and have not had a corporate confession of sin. But I just want you to think about it. If you've gone to this church or our types of churches before, how often do we do that? Now, just because they did it 500 years ago doesn't mean we ought to necessarily do it today, although perhaps that's something to think about. But I think... Passages like Lamentations 5, 
where they corporately confess sin, amongst many other passages in Scripture, perhaps say this is a communal thing, that as God's people we remember that we have sinned against him. As we pray, particularly as we pray together, but certainly as we pray on our own, we're to pray many things, but we are to confess our sins, confess our wrongdoing to God. But as we close, Jeremiah ends in perhaps a slightly strange way. Verse 21, Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. If it ended there, that would be great, wouldn't it? But then he says, unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. Um, Isaiah finishes in a very negative way, the final couple of verses. Malachi, I think, does as well. Lots of the sort of prophets of this stage did. And that was because there was an uncertainty. Not that there was uncertainty about God's character or who God was or that he was going to be faithful, but there was an uncertainty about what that meant for them as a people. What was it going to look like for God to deal faithfully with his people? What would happen to the nation? Lamentations ends on a note of uncertainty. But of course, our situation is different to Jeremiah's. Because Jeremiah was living 500 years before Jesus. For us, Jesus has already come. He has already bled on the cross for our sins. He's already been punished for our transgressions. We know those things to be true. We have the fullness of the Spirit living in us. And we have a confidence now, a confidence even that Jeremiah didn't have, a confidence that the prophets of the Old Testament longed to look into, longed to see, that if we repent, if we turn to Jesus, if we turn to the Lord afresh, he will renew us. He will restore us to the joy of our salvation. We can know confidently that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, that his mercies are new, that his faithfulness is great every single day. We can know those things, even in the tears, even in the pain, even in the suffering. That can be our experience if we turn to Christ. Now, we are going to sing in a moment. Um, it would be strange for me to... Um, is there another slide here? I don't know if I can... Is there another slide? Uh, is there one at the end of that? There we are. The previous one, sorry. Wait. I'll let you do it. What we're going to do, we are going to confess our sins. I'm going to read it through first of all so that you know what you're going to say. You don't have to do this, of course, but I'm going to encourage you if you are trusting in Jesus and to confess our sins together. So I'm going to read it through the first time just so you know what we're going to say. And if you want to say these words out loud... I'd encourage you to, if you want to say them in your heart, you can say them in your heart. I'll read it first. It says, um, which is, I'm plagiarizing the Anglicans here, by the way, in case you've ever been to an Anglican church. It says, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. That means the things that we ought to have done that we haven't done. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Now that's quite familiar words, perhaps, uh, depending on what church you've grown up in. I'm just going to have a moment of quiet now, perhaps where we can perhaps pray to God in our hearts. And then if you want to join me in saying these words, I'd encourage you to confess our sins uh, together. So let's just have a moment of quiet and then we'll say these words. Say the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And the great news is, if you have confessed that and meant it, these words in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Those things are true. He is faithful and just.